Hey everyone, it's Nick from Nick's Crossing. And uh, I hope you guys are doing well out there. I know things are a little crazy, but we have the holidays coming up and this means it's total train season for me. And uh, back in the day, I mean, Christmas time was all about train gardens and getting trains for Christmas and train shows. So today I actually wanna show you guys a small repair tutorial. And this is a U36C Chessie System, Western Maryland, built by Lionel between uh, the years of 1980 and 1990. And the U36C apparently was a interesting engine built by the GE back in the early 70s, I believe 71 to 75. And they made about 238 of these engines. They just look kind of bizarre, but I love this paint scheme. It's actually my first uh, U36C in my collection. So this engine actually came in the giant collection I acquired uh, a few weeks ago. So I'm still going through it between work and uh, personal life. And I, I hope to share every piece of that collection with you guys. I tried running this engine previously for a run day and it, it catastrophically failed. And um, I thought it'd be a great opportunity to open this engine up and show you guys how to maintain it and how to uh, fix the problems this engine's having. So this engine seems to have a few uh, just maintenance issues. So first off, when you start it up, you can hear it's buzzing, which is an automatic indicator that something's either dry on the inside, such as your brushes contacting your armature plates on your motor, or maybe it's not picking up electric uh, cleanly from the track. So let's, let's see how it does again. And now it's cranking. All right, I'm gonna run it in reverse. And here we go. I'll run it forward to get it back in the shot for you guys. So this engine sounds like it just needs to be uh, lubricated. And underneath, I'll show you guys in a second, the uh, gears to appear to be dry. So this engine was new old stock. It probably sat in their basement for many years or is transported around to uh, train shows and such. So this engine was never properly lubricated. Uh, Lionel does lubricate their engines before they're sold or they're supposed to, but every engine I've ever received has been lubed up and ready to go. And they usually say to lubricate the engines after, I think it's between eight and 12 hours of runtime. So usually once a year I go through my entire collection. I usually use like a tube of Molly grease and I'll grease the, um, the gear sets. And also on the inside, I'll use either a three in one oil on the armature pads. There's like, it says oil on the armature usually, and you can put a drop of oil there. So usually that works and holds these engines off for about a year or so. So before I take off the shell and show you guys the internals of this engine and show you guys how to maintain these motors, I wanna show you guys the uh, gear set. This is very interesting uh, what they did here. They actually used plastic gears between metal. And seeing how dry this is, if I ran this, I would say for any long period of time, these gears would just shred. I mean, these are gonna act as sacrificial parts. Um, it's very interesting why they would do that. I understand they're trying to save money. And these engines do have a lot of plastic on them compared to the pre and post-war engines that have uh, metal on metal gear sets. Usually they'd use like a, uh, a brass and those work really nicely. I have seen composite gears in pre-war engines. I usually change them out to be metal on metal gears anyways, because the composite gears are just really hard to find intact, especially if there's any type of water damage. Uh, I have a hunch that this engine just sat, and I don't think it's ever run for a long period of time because the uh, traction tires here are actually a little dry rotted, they're cracking. And I'm not really worried about them right now. I'll replace them in the future once they fall off. But right now this engine should work um, as is and when these do fall off they're pretty easy to find so I'm going to show you guys how to uh, get this shell off of here it looks like it's only held on by two screws one in the front there one in the back there all right so I'm going to use a Phillips screwdriver that is uh, pretty much what Lionel used to use for a lot of their items to get the shells off until you get into the pre-war era of trains they used a lot of uh, bladed screwdrivers or a flathead so yeah, knowing how tough that screw is to get off of there, this has never been open, which is a good sign for the most part. So anytime I service my trains, I like to put all my parts into a weighted parts container or like a Tupperware container that you can close up just in case you knock something off. Like this isn't going anywhere. 
So um, I'm going to take off the back screw here of the shell. And I have to be careful too, this is all plastic. I don't want to scratch it up, especially with the beautiful paint scheme on here. All right. Let's see. All right, let's see what's in here. All right, and we have something inside the shell. Look at that. So when you guys are taking shells off of engines, always be careful not to pull up on this, especially if it's snagged. Because as you can see, there's a light bulb. My cab bulb is here. And tearing that out would be catastrophic. I mean, that'd be an unnecessary repair. So knowing how clean this is, and this thing has never been opened or serviced ever. So just really quick, I wanted to go over some of the electronic components of this engine here. It's very basic. I mean, Lionel hasn't really changed this um, formula, I'd say for 70 plus years, give or take a few. Uh, I have pre-war engines with uh, very similar styles in it, and also a lot of post-war engines. And this actually would be closer to a post-war engine. So what you have here on your left, this is called your E unit. And this reverses the train and applies power to the motor. And what this will do is that when you apply power, it'll either stay still depending on what direction this is stuck in. Then when you turn off your handle conventionally, um, the power will stop. And then you'll actually hear a clicking sound. And the clicking sound is actually an electromechanical arm, which I can show you guys in this E unit that I've disconnected. This little arm here moves back and forth, switching the pole of your engine. And this E-unit is actually taken off of a pre-war 1688, which I'll show you guys in future videos. And this arm here works on gravity. When the electromagnet isn't applied, it's actually staying low here. Then the magnet's pulled in, and that pulls this wheel to change a direction like that. So just a simple explanation. I'm just a hobbyist, like I've said. Uh, this is just my basic understanding of how they work. And the main event is down here, and this is your strong AC motor. Modern Lionel engines, I believe, are starting to go the AC to DC route. And the DC motors are considered maintenance-free, so they don't have brushes here like this is set up. It's a different style motor. They're very hard to maintenance. Usually it's easier to just replace a DC motor than maintenance them. Uh, this, this motor is very easily maintained. So right here you have your brushes on your brush plate, and the brushes contact the armature, which is in here, as this spins. I can actually show you guys. You can see the motor is spinning in there where the red wire is all coiled up. And these motors, they actually colored the wire. You have green and red, which is pretty cool. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is uh, apply power to this and see if it is the motor being hung up here or it's the E-unit that needs to be lubricated or cleaned. All right, so I'm using my Lionel CW80 transformer to test this engine out. And I'm going to look for um, a couple things. I wanna see if it's sparking anywhere inside the engine for uh, dirty connections before I go any further. Uh, it most likely just needs to be lubricated all over, but we're gonna figure that out in a moment. So I'm actually hooking up my alligator clips to the uh, outer wheel here. If it arcs, it'll actually pit my uh, cast here. So I'm gonna apply some power and see what happens. All right, so it is stopped. The E unit is not going to work because it actually uses gravity. So I have it on an angle. So the electromagnetic pin can't retract. So I'm actually gonna Tip it over there, see if this will work. So guys, actually I had the uh, switch of the E unit off. So that actually locks it in position. So you can lock this engine in forward or reverse if you don't wish to use the uh, reverse feature. You can actually see I do this, it's 
it's very hard to see, but right here, you can actually see the pin go up and down, dropping for the E unit. So yeah, the engine just seems to be very dry, it just needs lubrication. So usually on these engines, there's a spot that says oil located right where the set screw is. Um, unfortunately, there is not a spot for that, but I actually have a product here that I'm going to use to lubricate that. And this is actually a CRC multi-purpose um, precision lubricant for electronics. And this says plastic safe improves electrical properties. So I recommend using this over top of WD-40 or any type of uh, lithium grease because the WD-40 can uh, spark up a fire. <laughs> it can also eat plastic sometimes. Like this plastic looks very frail. I mean, this is like definitely 80s plastic. Um, it's, it's a cheaper plastic compared to the 50s stuff that I have. You could probably bathe it in WD-40 and it wouldn't eat away. Uh, this stuff seems a little bit more fragile. So I am going to use this spray really quick inside the motor um, and also inside the E unit. Show you guys that really quick. So you don't want to get the spray everywhere, especially on your cast. Um, actually just going to get it right where the brushes meet. So right on top of the uh, brushes there. And for that, I'm actually just going to go through the back side of the E unit here. And then the side. You really don't want to get any on the uh, coil because there's a coil of wire right here. You don't want to get any type of chemical on there just in case so it doesn't eat away the uh, enamel that's sprayed on there for the uh, insulator. All right, guys, I ended up taking that set screw out with um, an Allen key here. And actually, I have a whole Allen key set that I definitely recommend picking up a uh, metric and a standard uh, set just in case you encounter something similar on an engine. Uh, I believe this set screw here was just meant for the oil port that's here. So in that case, I'm going to drop some old, old school three in one oil here in a can, just drop a few drops in there. And you gotta let it sink down. And that should be good. So I'm actually going to put this back And you always want to back thread, especially with this plastic threading here. You don't want to strip it out. All right, that's in as far as I'd like to put that. So on older engines that have been running for a while compared to a newer, uh, new old stock engine like this, I would take off this plate and make sure your armature plate is nice and clean. So your brushes that are located here are getting great electrical connection. So I was looking for um, a way to take this motor out and lubricate any type of like worm gear that transfers your power from your motor to your truck, like the uh, old school INL stuff. But it appears that there is not one that's accessible and it looks like the motor and truck are actually one piece here, which is very interesting because I really would like to get in there and service that. So really quick, I ran power through this engine and I found out that this set screw actually um, has a correlation with the uh, brush plate height that's located right above your armature actually your armature plate. So I ended up tightening that back. And right now it's working beautifully. I mean, this is a free spinning motor. It's very easy to turn compared to before. So I haven't encountered this before because this is actually one of the first MPC or um, LLC era diesels I've actually owned from Lionel. It's actually like using a uh, magnetized screwdriver for doing these types of jobs. And uh, it's very helpful because you won't lose your part on the floor Sometimes they can be a little tricky, but it does end up helping, especially having a dark floor up here. And uh, actually my parents' place before I moved had a darker concrete floor and we'd always lose train parts and we'd clean or do like spring cleaning and find all kinds of goodies under the desk. So internally, the uh, electromechanics sound great. They're working nice and smooth and they're not as loud and crunchy as they were before. But the uh, mechanical side of things here, I want to grease up these gears that I pointed out earlier. And today I'm going to be using this Hobby Lube Molly Grease by Woodland Scenic. And this stuff works great. Um, I've used a lot of it. Usually the tube's filled up all the way. Uh, as you can see, I'm running low. So I ended up buying some yesterday, and I believe it was around $9 or so on uh, Amazon. It'll be here in a few days.
what I'm going to do is actually squeeze some of this out and find out where it starts in the tube. And usually this stuff doesn't make too much of a mess. There it is. Just a little dot. It's hard to see on camera. But I'm actually going to just put a dot between, between them like that. Just a little bit. Because I don't want to get grease on my track. Because these, these uh, wheels here, if I put too much grease, I'll actually transfer it right to my uh, outer tracks. I don't want that. So let's do another little glob there. So and touch up the teeth on top. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is work this in by hand because if I crank up the motor on here, it's gonna fling it all over the place. So I'm gonna work this in for a little bit. And it looks like we need some more. So I'm actually going to apply it to my plastic gears. They're the ones I'm really concerned about. All right, before I let this engine run on the track, I'm actually going to run it with a little bit of power in here to get the grease moving in. It might fling a little bit. It already sounds so much better than before. nice and fast. So my grease is evenly spread. I think we're ready to give this engine a test run. All right guys, I think we're ready for some testing here. And just for fun, I hooked her up to a uh, Western Maryland chassis system bay window caboose. All right, let's see what happens. Much smoother than before. It's also much quieter. All right, guys, I think I'm done testing this engine for the day. And uh, it sounds great. I mean, this engine looks amazing. It does have that weird nose to it. Uh, it is kind of an acquired taste of an engine. But this engine performs great after just um, minor lubrication and work. So I'm actually going to go through the collection and find something else on the tracks that we can take apart today. And I can run through that as well. Alrighty, guys, this is the uh, second engine I'd like to open up this evening. And I want to do three engines so I can actually do a run day after repairing all of these. And uh, this is the SD24 with the Canadian Pacific road name. And I want to say this was built around the same time as that uh, U36 that we just opened up. Some dead giveaways, the wheel sets are the same. It's the uh, six wheel trucks. The plastic cast has the exact same uh, indentations like where the uh, handrails are and all that. It just seems like it's from the same era. And I want to say this is probably like late 80s or so, maybe early 90s. And the cool thing about this engine, after just running it here on the track to see what's up with it, it actually has a horn. So I think that's a nice touch. I'm not sure if it has a bell, but it definitely has an electronic horn. So we'll get everything up and running. We'll get this engine opened up on the table. So guys, I'm going to quickly diagnose this problem. So I believe that the issue with this engine See how it just picked up like that, and it's staying in the same direction. Let's see if we can do it again. Yeah, just like that, how it skipped. And it doesn't want to change direction immediately. And also that squeaking noise. So the engine sputtering like that, or stopping in its tracks, and then suddenly changing direction, <laughs> speeding up like that, that's usually the culprit of a sticky or dirty E-unit. So it's not a big deal. I believe the E-unit still works. It just needs to be clean and lubricated. So um, the pin in there is probably just not uh, being fully activated or deactivated. So we're going to get this on the table and start taking it apart. So when I first received this engine, I thought there was a horn or a bell just because of the perforated uh, tank here. And usually this indicates a speaker is residing in here. Later when I ran the engine, I found I did in fact have a horn. So just uh, as a takeaway, if you guys ever pick up one of these engines at a show or if you're looking at one in a train shop and you see that there is a perforated design somewhere on the engine, sometimes now they hide it like under the trucks, like give it a look like that. Uh, your engine that you're looking at may have a horn. 
So it's just a little bit of a plus. So already off the bat, I wanted to check the uh, gears here. It appears that there is some type of grease on there, and it's actually on my thumb now. It's like a clear, maybe like a lithium grease or so. Uh, we're going to add a little bit to that. It doesn't look like it's that old. Uh, this engine has been run before compared to the last one. Uh, also, your traction tire here seems a little bit worn. But yeah, it's not, um, it's not too bad. We'll hold on to those. But let's get this engine opened up. Just like before, we're going to take our screwdriver and take out the front and rear screws holding the shell on. And I bet you there is a light that is inside the uh, top of the shell, just like the uh, U36. Let me get this back screw out now. And also this back uh, railing here is also dented, so maybe someone dropped it or bumped into it. All right guys, so the shell of the uh, SD24 is off. And as you can see, it's very close to the U36 that we just had open. A uh, few minor differences. The uh, couplers on this engine are actually made of metal. So there's one here and then one down here. And these are actually a really nice touch. Uh, this engine appears to be actually a little bit older than the U36. And the only way I can tell that is that the motor is a different motor design. Uh, it actually seems a little bit bulkier and the plastic looks a little bit different. Not by much, it's still the same uh, style motor. I believe it's a Pullmore motor style. Also, our sound card here uh, appears to be in decent shape. Uh, I, I have heard that these go out relatively fast. Uh, it's the first thing that would go on here, honestly, because of just electronic components. But everything looks good. And um, we're not going to do anything with the sound card. Like I said, the horn works. So we're just going to uh, leave it alone, not touch anything on it. Um, you can see it's kind of peeling up, but we're just going to let it do its thing. So first thing first, what we're going to do is clean the E-unit with electrical contact cleaner. Then after that's clean, we're going to uh, lubricate it with the uh, electrical lubricant spray. And then we're going to uh, spray a little bit of contact cleaner on our motor here. And then put a drop of 3-in-1 oil on each one of these brushes after spraying it with the electrical lubricant as well. So my contact cleaner of choice is actually the CRC brand uh, QD electrical cleaner that you can actually pick up from, I want to say, most hardware stores, um, even like auto centers. And this stuff works great. It doesn't leave a residue. Uh, it quick dries so you don't have cleaner everywhere. So one thing to watch out with contact cleaner is that it can start a fire if it doesn't properly dry. I've actually lit um, like whistling units on fire before because it creates a draft. <laughs> Uh, it's pretty scary. It actually just floof. It just goes. So definitely watch that. This stuff is highly flammable. So what we're going to do is just put a little bit inside the uh, reverse unit here. And we're going to let that dry. I might as well do the motor while I'm at it as well. All right, we're gonna let that dry. It should uh, should dry relatively fast. This stuff also is very potent smelling, so be careful of that. All right, already the motor feels a little bit freed up, so there's probably just a little bit of grime in there. All right, so the next order of business is to, I'm gonna first spray it with the uh, CRC Multipurpose Precision Lubricant. And this stuff's made for electronics, which is awesome. I actually picked this up from Home Depot in their electronics section. So a little spray there, a little spray there. I'm going to let that work in. And I'm going to go to the uh, E unit now. And I have to find an entry point here. So let's do right there. And then underneath. This E unit actually appears to be a little bit trickier to get to for any type of maintenance, but I'll find a way in. Then for the motor, like I said before, take a little bit of 3 in 1, put a little bit on each one of our brushes here. And brushes technically are sacrificial, so eventually you will have to replace them. And I'm talking after 
probably hundreds of hours of running these trains. Wow, look at that. Yeah, it's already freed up a lot. So that seems like it's ready to roll. All right, guys, we're all wired up for testing here, so let's give it some power. All right, so the E unit just stuck there. All right, that sounds great. Ah, so it is sticking. But let's see if I tilt it up this way, see if it still sticks. All right, guys, so that's working great. Uh, I'm assuming maybe it just needed to be worked in there, some of the uh, lubricant spray. But the E unit is working beautifully. And here's the horn just so you guys can hear it. So it's kind of obnoxious, and without the uh, shell on, it's actually much louder. And usually this engine will be facing down, so the uh, speaker's right at the camera. So, All right, so the next step would be lubing up the gears here. All right, guys, I um, already applied some grease in here and just working it in by hand before I let this thing run. Like I said, I don't want to mess with grease all over the wall and all that stuff, so... All right. I just want to run it nice and slow so I'll make a mess everywhere. You just hear how smooth this engine is now. All right, guys, so it sounds like we're ready to test this engine out in the tracks. All right, guys, we're ready to give this a test run. And I actually coupled it up with the uh, bay window caboose that came with this engine. Uh, they were right next to each other in the box, so maybe they were intended for a set. I also have a couple of Canadian Pacific uh, freight cars that were also in the same box when we got this collection. So here we go. It sounds like this train just wants to run. It seems like the E unit is still sticking, but it could be a design flaw as well. Uh, knowing that this engine's a little bit older, maybe it's just something in the design. Who knows? So it works great. It actually kind of crawls as well. So we're going to move on to our third engine for the evening. And after that, we're going to run all three on the tracks up top and below. All right, guys, this is the third and final engine I'm going to try to repair tonight. This engine's called a DC-15 or MPDC-15. And it's an EMD switcher. I think it looks really nice and this is actually a model produced by K-Line and the road name is uh, Connecticut Copper Corporation KCC number 906 and I'm assuming it's built in the late 90s because the safety sticker says 1997 it also has a front logo there which is a nice touch so unfortunately this engine currently has a catastrophic fail <laughs> due to the uh, the wheels here that are cracking and also my front wheel here is also uh, showing some cracking and then some seizing. Uh, this engine works off of two DC motors, which are located here and also here. And that's a typical K-Line um, 90s model, which they've also done with this uh, 26001 Baltimore and Ohio uh, transit here. So the interesting thing is that I actually had to buy one of the trucks to replace one of these and it did not include the motor I just needed the wheel set the reason I had to do that is because it wasn't picking up enough power the power of the engine through these tabs here so I ended up transplanting uh, one from the other and then putting the new one on something else unfortunately if you ever open up one of these and I'm assuming it's the same with this engine here everything is uh, <laughs> through a circuit card so like there is no E unit it's all electronic so that also makes it kind of harder to uh, maintain or service if there's a problem. So we're going to get this engine uh, taken apart. I'm going to try to figure out how to get this cast or this shell off without damaging it. It is quite flimsy. Like this is all plastic here. The front and rear um, handrails here are metal. They're included with the frame. But I'll try to get it off and then I'll cut ahead to show you guys what I've discovered on the inside. All right, guys, it appears that the screw to take off the shell is actually right here. And it's just a very small screw in the front of the nose of this engine. Right under the grill here. And I'm assuming it's going to slide forward once the screw is undone. 
very carefully. All right, guys, so this has turned out to be a very uh, tedious process taking off this shell. So I found the screw that was hidden right in that dimple there, and it was attached to the frame right here. So after that screw was undone, I was wondering why I couldn't get the shell off. So I tried wiggling it back and forth after seeing this crimp piece here. Later I found out that these were tied in to the frame of the shell right there, right where that hole is. So I had to carefully wiggle that out with a screwdriver using a very fine blade screwdriver. And then after that, I was able to scoot this forward and then pull up and the shell came right off. So if you guys don't feel comfortable with something like this, I would highly recommend to take it to a uh, professional service technician or if you guys like to press your luck and practice with it, just keep a very close eye out to what you're doing and make sure if, if something can't move or something is lodged, just make sure nothing's holding it down. So I've definitely broken things in my day, but I've definitely learned my lessons as well. So this K-Line unit here is extremely different from the last two Lionel models we opened up. This model actually uses a circuit card to not only reverse the train, but also to convert the AC voltage off your track power into a DC current for the two motors that are located on your trucks. Right there and there. So the last two models we opened up primarily work off of electromechanical principles and just simple electronics. This is a little bit more sophisticated. So honestly, if this reverse unit would go up or um, something were to go up with the motors, I honestly wouldn't know what to do. I'd probably end up buying a, uh, maybe a, uh, cruise commander for this or some type of replacement that is a plus side with these k-line engines they are kind of ready to be upgraded so you already have your dc motors there so if you wanted to convert this to some type of tmcc or dcs unit it'd be much easier to do but anyways we're going to try to get these trucks off of here so i can get these wheels off so we can at least have a running unit and i did see it has a front and rear light which is really cool to have and these bulbs both look good so we should be able to see both lights caught on once we get her running. So thankfully the wheels I would like to replace on this truck set are located up front and they're not in the back here underneath the circuit card. In that case I'd actually have to take the circuit card off, move it somewhere else while I do the work and then reinstall the circuit card. Up front here underneath these um, ballast weights we have our pin here that's holding it all together. I'm going to try to get in here to relieve this pin and I believe it's called a U-pin and we're going to relieve that to get to our trucks. So this pin actually came off pretty easily using a screwdriver inside one of these holes here. You just want to move your screwdriver, just move it back and forth, and the pin has been released. So this truck should drop straight out. So the truck actually came out pretty easily, and unfortunately there's a whole mess of things going on here because of all the wires that are down to the trucks. All right, guys, so um, I ended up taking these screws out of these holes here that would look like this on an untouched truck from K-Line. Taking these two out, I'm on the quest to take these side plates off. So normal Lionel post-war would actually have screws here and there to take off these facades, but this is a little bit more tricky and it's all cast plastic. So I took that out and this ended up coming off very easily. And then I saw that this was moving as well for your coupler. And I've actually been in these before to change the couplers out. And I think that was one of the main reasons why I fixed up the B&O engines, because the couplers broke off. So there's actually another set of screws that's actually on the back side of this. And I'm actually going to have to access them through the cast, or through this uh, frame here, through the wire hole, which is kind of insane. I did warn you guys this would be a more advanced uh, train fix here. But this seemed to work, and I can't, I don't have a lot of clearance because of the uh, wiring in here, which is insane as well. So, we can do this side too. I know it looks ridiculous on camera, I'm, try <laughs> I'm trying my best here. <laughs> so that screws out, so in theory, this should pop off. And it did, look at that. All right, guys, that was a lucky shot. So I'm only going to replace the uh, front set here. Let me actually try using a screwdriver. And, like this is all plastic. This isn't like your typical 
uh, Lionel post-war cast here. Oh, man. There's one. Oh, cool. Look at that. That was lucky as well. So we actually have... You know, honestly... Because one's a different color than the other, I'm just going to use both wheels off this set here. Um, I'm going to put this into my spares because you never know when this back wheel goes up, I'll end up replacing that as well. All right, guys, this is the set I'm going to take off of here. I actually looked at these wheels in closer detail. This one's completely pitted. Uh, looks like it shorted out pretty bad and just ate it away. So we're going to use this set here. These look okay, I guess. And I also need a set with a with a gear on it. So I'm actually going to have to take this one out. All right, guys, I ended up getting the wheels out but it was not pretty. It was actually a very uh, unorthodox way that unfortunately uh, kind of destroyed the truck. So I figured out that there was a lot more corrosion and this wire was completely roached out. So I ended up cutting that out using a Dremel tool. Uh, usually I don't like doing that. I like preserving these, but uh, after looking at these plates here and this wheel set back here, it's already roached out. So I did get the wheels out that I would like to use. These wheels aren't perfect either, but they should be able to do the job. So I can actually use the wheel puller now as well. Show you guys how that works. And you're going to line this up with the center. And I'm going to screw this down here. Keeps wanting to jump out. And we're going to get my Allen key for this. All right, guys, we got the Allen key ready to go. So lightly twist this through the center punch and actually see it working now all that effort just for that Isn't that amazing just a little bit of effort got that out of there so this wheel looks pretty good uh, other than this this uh other than this little bite here it should work still and maybe the next time i'm at a show i'll pick up some old k-line wheels so here's the old wheel on there i'm actually going to throw that away right now so I don't get that confused with my uh, my good set right here. So we're going to put this through very carefully. It's a Franken train, so to say. <laughs> All right, and that should line up. Yep, that lines up with our gears. And this is free spinning now. Very carefully just press it down. And if you need to, sometimes you can use a pair of pliers. All right. Let's see if I can actually push a little bit more on here. This wheel set's complete, and it runs pretty nice. I mean, I found out this wheel set was getting choked up on old pieces of lubricant, which is here, like all this black, uh, dusty stuff here. Uh, the lubricant solidified and became a almost like a rock. Same with this side here, it's being choked up a little bit. So I'll have to uh, clear that out using a like a fine blade screwdriver and each tooth and just clean it out. So we're gonna get this all assembled back together and uh, hopefully we can get it ready for testing. And then we can run all the trains at once. All right guys, it's time to test this engine and uh, actually put this whole thing back together and forgot to put these back into the shell. So that was kind of also a pain in the butt. So again, we have a great working engine right here, and it's just a little bit different, a little bit more complex than the last one for sure. Actually, the last two <laughs> for sure. So uh, let's get these on the rails and let's get a run day going here. All right, guys, behind our Connecticut Copper MP15 engine, uh, I wanted to run some awesome steel or metal gondolas here that are related to the metal industry. So behind our uh, Connecticut Copper engine, we have a seaboard gondola there. Behind that is an infamous Bethlehem Steel. Behind that is a Patapsco and Back Rivers Company, which I believe was around the Baltimore area. And then behind that is Republic Steel. So all of them, I'm sure they're all competitors at one time, except the Seaboard car is literally a Seaboard car. <laughs> so I just thought that was cool. It's just a gondola. But anyways, on our second track here, we have the Chessie System U36 engine. And behind that, we have a Western Maryland reefer car. We have a CNO hydraulic lift car, which is really awesome. Behind that, we have a CNO box car, followed by another CNO box car, 
And then the CNO or Chessy and Western Maryland caboose. So on this siding here, I'm actually um, just keeping my Western Maryland caboose just chilling there. All right, so for track number one, we're gonna run the SD24, followed by a uh, British Columbia tanker, British Columbia auto carrier, an awesome old school CP rail um, auto carrier, a CN covered hopper, and then a Canadian Pacific caboose. Now this is honestly the first time I've ever ran anything with the, uh, well anything to do with Canadian road names. I've always liked the CP rail logo there and also the British Columbia design. Also, I remember playing Train Simulator growing up as a kid and running these engines on the game. So this is actually really cool to finally own one of these. And all these cars actually came in that collection as well. So I'm happy to own them, happy to run them, and obviously happy to take care of them as well. Um, on that note, all aboard, let's run some trains. guys that's going to do it for the day i'd like to thank you for joining me in this repair video and hopefully this helped you out if you're trying to repair some of your um, older mpc or llc engines or if you have a k-line engine with the same wheel problem so I, I really hope this could help you guys out if you guys ever feel uncomfortable repairing your own trains just make sure you send them to someone that knows what they're doing you would never want to receive something in worse condition than what you sent but anyways this might also be able to help you guys out for future train shows whenever they may start up again so at train shows, I always tend to ask if the engine does run or if we can see it run. A lot of times the vendors will say, yes, it does run or we're not sure, especially if it's an estate. The best thing you can do is take it to a test track that's usually located at a train show. If it does anything similar to the two engines on the right, I'd recommend picking them up and just try to service them really or lubricate them. They probably just need minor work, probably nothing to do with rewiring. Any older engines like a post-war engine or a pre-war engine Yes, that might need some wiring, and I'll actually do a video on those in the near future. 
But anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you guys in future videos.